We're going to move on to some NFL talk, but Brad, we're going to do something a little bit different here. We're going to start off with Iceman Stat of the Week, normally something that we do at the end, but today we're going to do it here because it really is meaningful for what we're going to talk about. So this is week one. Obviously, I would say that there was a lot of mediocre quarterback play. So I have a stat to sort of quantify mediocre quarterback play. Are you ready? Of course, my friend. Let's hear it. All right. So NFL quarterbacks this weekend threw for, on average, 188.3 passing yards per game, which is the fewest in any week since 2007 in a league that people are telling you is a pass-first league. On top of that, there were 35 passing touchdowns in week one in 2024. Do you know how many there were in just 2021? That's only three years ago. No idea. 61. Wow. So what that tells- Think about the quarterbacks you've lost since then. Right, but I think what that tells me is that the preseason is completely meaningless and useless. That- I think that so many starters are not playing anymore that you're getting constipated offense in week one. And that's that's honestly what I saw watching Red Zone, is it seemed like there's a lot of mediocre quarterbacks who either aren't in a rhythm or what, but it's a trend. Passing in week one is coming down, and I think that's directly correlated to the fact that these guys just do not play in the preseason anymore. No, you're right, and uh, I don't think that's going to change, especially when you're paying these guys what you're paying them at this point in time, and and they've proven, especially the quarterback position, to be so valuable um, and directly tied to your success and ability to compete for championships. So I uh, can't say you blame him. I can't can't say that I blame him, and yeah, Mike makes a good point there. Uh, you know, longer season for sure, so they're trying to preserve these guys' bodies a little bit more. And, you know, and you know what we always know, we notice, of course, the quarterback and stuff like that. But, you know, I I, what I'd like to know, um, because I don't pay this much attention, but, you know, some of some of the more like some of the line, like offensive linemen or receivers or running backs, even and defensive players, you know, are these guys playing more limited snaps uh, because of the longer season than they typically would? You know, are they kind of easing all of these guys into things a little? Um, I'd be curious to know uh, kind of where that stacks up compared to, you know, five years ago. I'm not, I don't, I'm not curious enough to like dig into it <laughs> by any means, but like, uh, I, I'd wonder if that's happening. Probably not so much on offense because you want to protect the quarterback, but, um, but you did, I don't know. Yeah. It hasn't looked great. And constipated offense is a great way to put it. Yes. Um, yes. It know, was, and it was not is such an important part of offense, right? Oh, it really, yeah, it really is. And I think, to add on to that too, I think that the big money that these teams are spending on especially their skill position players, I think they know that the players just do not want to play in the preseason because they're just too valuable. There's too much money tied up in them, especially a quarterback. Like why on earth would the Chiefs put Patrick Mahomes in any snaps in the preseason? He'll figure it out. Like, you know, he's going to figure it out. And why would they do that? They have so much money tied up in this guy. I, I hope that the NFL comes up with like a happy medium of how to do this because I think that obviously there are certain guys who can use the reps, use the playing time, the game experience. But for the most part, the guys that you know are probably going to start week one. I mean, how many of them really need it? Week one is basically your preseason. And so I think it's natural that you're going to see a trend that offense is going to be bad. But the only game that we saw a good quarterback play was the first one. Yeah, and I think it's basically. fans as fans, we forget these guys are human, man. And this is their job, right? So think about you and your job. Let's say you work somewhere and you have, you have some sort of responsibility that ties into like making budget, right? At the end of the year, making budget. And, uh, that that's the goal, right? That's your super bowl. If we can make budget, like it's been a great year, I'm going to get a fat bonus, whatever the case may be. And is your level of effort going to be higher on the last month of the fiscal year than it is the first month of the fiscal year probably right yes you're probably not putting in the effort or having the attention to detail even though those things uh could you know are going to ultimately build up to your goal you're not going to be putting the same effort into into that stuff early in the year you you know because and probably especially if you've had experience in this and you know that like hey 
I don't they don't need my best effort right now. As long as I show up in Q4, we're gonna be fine. And uh, you know, I guarantee you that the you know the Tyreek Hills of the world and some of these guys might be listen, brother. As long as I'll be here when it matters, um, and when it counts, and we'll get it done. But uh until then, leave me alone. Yes, I I mean that's what I would say. Anyway, so let's let's talk through some of these. So first game was Thursday night, Ravens and Chiefs, two teams I think that you and I know objectively are going to be good teams in the NFL, which I think is kind of fewer and far between. Like, I don't think we feel as confident about a lot of teams. And that game, we saw what I thought was two teams basically playing chess, trying to figure each other out. And what it comes down to is that it's very, very possible that the site of the AFC Championship game is going to come down to a big toe because that's really what it came down to in that game. But I want to ask you a fundamental question. I think I said it to you in text. When I watched this game, you and I talked about Lamar Jackson. Like, what is it about him? There's so much talent there. Why don't they win more, right? Or win games that matter more. And I said, and it's not to disparage his talent. I just think that Lamar Jackson is such a unique talent. And he's so much more talented than everybody on his team, even at the pro level. But I feel like he's missing the elevating. Does that make sense? Whereas Mahomes does whatever he has to do to make it work. He elevates guys and guys, I don't know, there's some, there's like an it factor with Mahomes that seems to be there, doesn't seem to be there for Lamar. And I don't know if it's because his playing style is so unique. What do you think? Because I haven't quite figured it out. That's a good point. Um, you know who else was kind of like that? Uh, now, definitely personality wasn't the same, but Cam Newton was like that, right? Uh, exceptional talent, but he didn't really elevate his teammates or guys around him. You know, he he was like Pey I was saying Peyton Manning was sort of a star maker, right? Like he would make a household name out of a guy that nobody would have ever ever heard of otherwise. <laughs> yes. um, you know, Patrick Mahomes has sort of proven the ability to do that, like you said. Um, I. To, like it feels like it's Lamar and just whoever they can round up to send out there with them. I, that, that's what it. There's just doesn't. There's not a lot of star power on that offense otherwise, and it's because like he doesn't. He doesn't have like a like. This is his number one receiver. You know, like this. Like you know, a lot of these other guys. You know, like the Mahomes and Kelsey and um, you know, the Peyton Manning and Reggie Wayne and you know, there's a lot of these famous tandems and like he doesn't have he's batman he doesn't have a robin there's no one else and and it's not saying these guys aren't talented it's just i think you're right i think it's the way he plays the game uh that it's just it's almost like he tries to put it all himself it's him against the world type of thing it feels like i don't know if it's intentional i just think part right. of it might be that's just the way the dudes always had to play the game because he was for a long time in his career he was pro or throughout playing football He's probably always been the most talented guy on the field and just had to find a way to to make things happen on his own. And it's, I think it's tough to break someone of that, especially if they've had success doing it, which he has. Yeah, I mean, he's won MVPs. He's put up ridiculously gaudy stats. And I will say that he probably has Mark Andrews, probably the closest thing that he's had to a guy that he would consider like his reliable number one. But even Mark Andrews has had injury issues They've tried to get receivers in there. They had Hollywood Brown. That didn't work out. They got Isaiah Likely, who's the guy with the big toe, who Dave said they got to send to ballerina school, because ballet school, because, like, figure out how to toe tap or else they win that game, right? And Mahomes, I thought, had the presser of the year so far when they asked him about it, and he said, bro's just got to wear the white cleats next time. And I'm like, that's, that's <laughs> spot on, spot on. But the Chiefs winning, the Ravens not winning doesn't tell me a lot about either team. It was a good game. It's a game that I think we could see again in the playoffs, and it is what it is. But we talked about the, the Brazil game last week, Packers, Eagles. It's actually a pretty decent game, but nobody's talking about the result because Jordan Love gets hurt with six seconds to go, and everybody's talking about field conditions. Now, I know that you have something to say about this. Well, the field conditions were bad. Um and they were bad before Jordan Love got hurt. Yeah, they, it was talked about throughout the game. They were interviewing the coaches about it, um, you know, in in game interviews and asking questions. So, I I think that it, the the bad part is is the the NFL is trying so hard to make this a global game and to generate more revenue, but at what expense? Obviously, I mean, these are professional athletes, okay, and especially the nature of this game and how physical it is, and how much wear and tear there is on the body. They need to play on a surface that is appropriate for their level of talent and their abilities. And a 
sorry, a soccer pitch in Brazil or wherever the Brazil is not it. Um, you know, I think there's a standard that has to be put in place uh, when they play these games. I'm sure they would say there is one or whatever. Well, it needs to be raised a lot if there is. Um, and I think that, and again, the NFL is a businessman putting profit ahead of player safety. And, and it's not just with field conditions and this sort of thing with the international games. Um, you know, it's, it's with, with CTE. They still, I think, you know, they basically pretend it doesn't exist. Uh, they still don't talk about it uh, and stuff like that. Um, I, that's one thing that really stinks. I think that's kind of the dark underbelly of the NFL is it's it, at the end of the day, it's a business that operates like one. And it is certainly profit ahead of player safety, no matter what sort of different fluff they put on it, in the public eye. And it's really a shame because Jordan love is one of the, you know, up and coming young talents and at the quarterback position, especially. And like, Mahomes needs like he needs someone to ra- rise up in the NFC to challenge him. You know, we need <laughs> we've had that throughout football history, right? Like uh, these great duels between quarterbacks. Um, and I feel like we don't really have that guy at this point in time in the NFC. We got some guys that could maybe become that guy. Uh, and he was one of them. And I, I'm, of course, anything else could happen. A crazy hit, something on a perfect playing surface uh on a legal hit you know could injure him but why increase the odds by playing on an un uh what i would consider to be an unacceptable playing surface it's made for players in play style that just do not mesh soccer players it's a finesse game they're moving so much differently they're lighter in some cases like a hundred pounds or more lighter out there on the field and yes they're moving around constantly but the impact the impact right the the way the the force of nature that football players have, the way that they're cutting, the way that they're built, they need a field that can match that intensity, that can match the style of play. But what kills me is the NFL can't even get field conditions right. Remember Super Bowl a couple years ago, guys were slipping all over the place. And that was at an NFL stadium. So they clearly do not understand what it means to put their players in the best position to succeed. And to me, succeeding is not just making money to them it is but the safer the players are the more they're out there the more exposure that they get the more dollars that the nfl stands to make and so it's just a bad look like it's a bad look when the fans are like who cares about brazil nobody cares at least here nobody cares and then you got a guy get hurt and that's all that people are talking about which is the exact opposite of what the nfl wants and before the game, Goodell said he wants to have 16 games a year internationally. And this is before Jordan Love got hurt. So it just tells you, you know what they're looking out for. And it's not the players. But that was the first two games, first two stories. It was pretty crazy. A big toe and Jordan Love is out. Now, I will say this, and I want to say this directly. If you were one of the people who said that Jordan Love was soft because he got hurt by the way that he got hit because your 10-year-old gets up from hits that are harder than that, Please tell me you've never played a sport of any kind. Have no idea what you're talking about because that is some of the most ignorant shit I've ever heard. Yeah, these people are idiots, man. They say that kind of stuff. Absolute idiots. Um, one takeaway I think I texted you about after that game or at some point in time over the weekend was, you know, so obviously Thursday night we saw two of the best teams in the AFC. And, um, you know, in that game was two of the perceived better teams in the NFC. Obviously, you know, you're still missing the 49ers in Detroit, but. Uh, it's two very like the they looked a lot more polished and ready to go, yeah. uh, in the AFC matchup than yes, than in the NFC matchup. It was sloppy, a lot of turnovers. Uh, I mean, it was definitely not the level of play that you would expect out of two teams that have some pretty high expectations coming into the season, yeah. But it goes down to sloppy play. I mean, even looking at some of the other results. Patriots beat the Bengals in Cincinnati. Everybody had that, of course. A terrible game, by the way. Absolutely terrible game. Jacoby Brissett, like 130 yards. The Patriots, death by a million paper cuts. But Gerard Mayo gets his first win, and probably one of very few that they're going to get in New England. But you get that. The Steelers kick six field goals, win by eight points over the Falcons on the road. In what I believe you said, Falcons minus three might be the most obvious thing ever, but you picked the Steelers to win that game. Right. So... You know, just bad play all over the place. And then you get the Cowboys and the Browns. So the Cowboys signed Dak $240 million 
Good for him. They look great against the Browns. Not really the story. The story is Deshaun Watson. And we're not even going to talk about the stuff that came out about him after the fact. But I don't know how you thought about it. I looked and watched him play, and I thought, that is a man who no longer knows how to play quarterback at an NFL level. And you know what? I'm tickled pink because the Browns hopefully are saddled with $239 million guaranteed that they cannot get out from. That's the story here is this is just shining a gigantic spotlight on that decision. And it's not, I mean, I I don't know the Browns. Could the Browns be set any further back than they already are just like by default. Um, But they've somehow found a way to outdo themselves. And uh, it stinks, man. Like I want so bad for the Browns to be like, I want to be like the lions. You know, I want to see the lions and the freaking Browns in the super bowl. And like the, toughest most grittiest super bowl ever uh <laughs> but the browns aren't holding up their end of the bargain um i just the the fine people of cleveland deserve better they've deserved better for a long time and uh to be stuck with that guy uh despite all even the despite the off the field issues just, just to be stuck with him as a quarterback at this point in time sucks and for you to get up every day and drag your sorry ass to your miserable <laughs> job knowing that that guy is making the kind of money he is and going out there performing the way he's performing has got to be incredibly depressing. Um, it's just, it sucks, man. And because uh, they, I just feel like they deserve better. I don't know why. Like, just maybe not the franchise, but the people, they deserve better. Now, you and I both thought that the Falcons were going to look a lot better, but Kirk Cousins still looked like he might actually still be hurt. He might actually still be recovering. He didn't look very confident in the pocket. Didn't look like he could make some of the throws that I think that we're used to seeing him make. And the general question I want to ask you as it relates to some of these teams, I mean, not the Jets, even though Rodgers was fairly pedestrian, like 150 yards, it didn't look very good. But if you're the Browns or you're the Falcons, now the Browns have Jameis Winston, so you kind of know what you got there. But I think they have a good, solid team behind him, right? Like Joe Flacco got them to the playoffs last year. But if you're the Falcons, if Cousins looks like this three weeks in a row, at, are you thinking about Penix right now? Uh, probably. I mean, there's so much pressure on uh, these organizations to play these young guys. Um, probably. Uh, I don't think, uh, I don't see any, I mean, if you're going to be not very good anyways, why not? We talked about this, I think, last week. Let Penix sit there and learn. Um, I was assuming Cousins seems like a pretty good dude. I can't imagine that he's not like trying to teach him and, and coach him up. Uh, even though they, you know, he, he's there to take his job. I don't think he's giving him the Brett Favre treatment. Uh, I might be wrong. Who knows? But, um, you know, I think what you have with Cousins is you have a high floor, but a low ceiling. Uh, you kind of know what you're going to get. Um, and just he's not the kind of guy that's going to go out there and win a game for you. Like he, uh, while Lamar Jackson may not need a supporting cast, Cousins does. Uh, he needs some dudes, and um, I mean they got some guys, right? But uh, yeah. there's there's still you know uh, they're not um, not enough to I think bail him out, if you will. So I, I do think you're going to start hearing people call for Penix, and, and he'll probably end up in there because that's just the way this thing goes uh, most of the time, unfortunately. Uh, but I don't think that's going to solve their problems. I, I I think this isn't this isn't this wasn't going to be an overnight like rebuild flip the script now that the falcons are are legit like some people thought it might have been um you know, it's gonna take some time but these two teams have some interesting parallels at quarterback in the sense that you obviously have the browns who signed to sean watson to that contract which i think you and i would agree probably the worst contract in nfl history if not one of the most wor- yeah. one of the worst yeah it's up there and then you got the falcons who so they signed Kirk Cousins, I think it was like $120 million. And then they draft Michael Penix. And the combination of the two is very concerning because if you really think about it, their process was pretty bad because if you're gonna draft Penix, why would you spend all that money? Like it's a lot of money on a guy, Kirk Cousins, who's what, like 36 years old? And then, or you draft Cousins, he's really great, or you pay him, and then all of a sudden you draft Penix, who's not gonna see the field and he's older. So like both of these franchises have put themselves in the weirdest spot with the quarterback position because I think the Browns now are stuck. And look, they're going to try to get out of that contract. You and I both know that. 
I don't think they should. I think they should be saddled with it. And I think that if you are somebody who thinks you know anything about GMing, just point to that move and say, this is exactly what you don't do. Because they didn't do any due diligence on the man, any due diligence on his mental health, all that stuff. And they're, I mean, I think I saw that if they let him go next year, they have, he's like a $72 million cap hit. It's insane. They're probably they're probably behind the the recent allegations <laughs> that have come up, so they can uh, what I what are they you know violation of uh, oh yeah conduct there pod, whatever you know, they're, they're gonna you know, find a way out of this thing. Um, you know they almost don't deserve to because of how terrible of a decision it was. Uh, but at some point in time, yeah, you got to turn the page. Um, yeah, definitely puzzling. We'll see though. Like I said, one game. Watch they might come out this week, both of them, and you know, look awesome. I doubt it, but it's possible. It is possible. Now, you also said that the NFC was missing some of its best teams. So that would be the 49ers, who I think looked amazing against the Jets. Now, the Jets came out, looked good on one drive. But I think overall, it was obvious to me that the Jets are not in the same class as the 49ers. The 49ers look like they're ready to make a playoff run right now. And the Jets looked soft. They kind of got beat up. Like, they really got beat up on the line. Then you got the Lions, who, if that wasn't a gritty win, what then what was it? Yeah, I was happy to see the Lions get the victory, of course. I thought that, uh, you know, I've been nervous. I expressed my uh, concern that, you know, maybe this grittiness shtick maybe would fade or wear off and whatnot, especially over the course of a couple seasons. But here we are, and then they're, they look to be... Um, right where we, you know, right where they finished off at, which is nice. And then you're right. The Jets didn't look great, but I'm almost willing to give them a pass because you know, I think the 49ers are really good. Um, yes. You know, much different than like the Green Bay and Philadelphia game. Uh, you know, maybe two evenly matched teams that didn't play very well. Uh, the 49ers look great. And, um, and of course, I'm not going to be able to think of his name, but the dude that filled in for McCaffrey running back, just a stud, straight stud. Yep. Uh, but, Kyle Shanahan's showing just like the old man that he he he's a star maker at the running back position. Now McCaffrey oh, yeah. was already a dude, but like I mean, how many guys did did he turn out? You know, did uh, Mike Shanahan turn out and then make probably make Hall of Famers with his uh, run game? And um, you know, so just plug and play, man, uh, in a in a Shanahan offense, and that's what they're doing. Uh, they looked really sharp, and you know, I talked earlier about someone needing to rise up to meet Mahomes and people might be like, well, the 40, 49ers, yeah, 49ers, yes, but Brock Purdy ain't it. Like, um, you know, he's good and he does a good job, but like he is, he's good enough to not lose the game for you. And I'm not, I don't want to throw the game manager tag on there. I'm not saying that, but like he's, he's not going to win the game for you. Uh, same with um, dude in Detroit. who uh, <laughs> Goff. Goff. Same with Jared Goff, man. The, Li the Lions are very good. Um, and thank goodness the rest of the roster is extremely talented that he doesn't have to play outside of himself. And that's how I feel about uh, Brock Purdy in, in San Francisco is the roster is extremely talented, so he doesn't have to play outside of himself. He can play with you know within the offense, and I guess you know you say within the system, but he's not a system quarterback. I don't know. Maybe he is a system quarterback. He's a damn good one. He's just not a star. Isn't theoretically every quarterback a system quarterback at some point? Like you have to develop in the right way. How many guys have we seen have all the talent in the world? Zach Wilson, right? All the talent in the world in terms right. of raw talent. Couldn't make it work. Definitely probably won't make it work in Denver either. But the thing that's so fascinating about Brock Purdy is the amount of value that the 49ers have at quarterback. Like they have a guy who makes peanuts compared to what everybody else makes but a guy who can do a lot of the things that some of the mid-tier guys like are you kidding me like would the giants rather have brock purdy or daniel jones right now not even a contest and it's not right. as if brock purdy is like the elite of the elite but i said to you he makes the throws he's supposed to make he's got a ton of guys out there greg kittle just goes open puts his hand up and brock's like that's all i gotta do right backyard football kind of stuff but when they go up against Mahomes, who is a guy who can do anything that it takes to win, what happens? They lose, and they've continued to lose. And that's what I think that they're missing. But the Jets, yes, you want to give them a pass, but I'm going to tell you something right now. Robert Sala is not the guy. I think I saw a stat that he has like 18 wins as Jets head coach and 19 double-digit losses. Like, that's not great. Whew. 
No, that's not great. And I think it's going to be a race to see who gets fired first between him and Brian Dayball. Um, oh, the, the difference Giants is, is so bad. The difference is Brian Dayball like has the scapegoat of Daniel Jones um, to to maybe utilize it to his advantage. But uh, Daniel Jones also making a hell of a lot of money. Um, where Robert Sala has a Hall of Famer at quarterback, and you know, sure we can sit there and look at the rest of the roster and and whatever. But at the end of the day, you know, that's you know, you're tied so much as a head coach, I think, to the talent and ability of your quarterback. And, um, you know, so it'll be interesting to see how that plays out. And I'm wondering, you know, if the things do go, you know, because of course Rodgers got hurt last year, so he didn't play the season. And uh, if things do go south with the Jets, you know, what happens there internally? You know, how big of an issue does Rodgers become? You know, is there um, internal strife between him and, and the staff or him and other players, you know, and um, it'll be kind of uh I don't want to say interesting to watch. It could probably be sad to watch, truthfully. Yeah, probably. But this is what you get paid for. What can I say? You yeah. mentioned the Giants. Good Lord. I mean, the Giants. They're bad, brother. Wow. <laughs> wow. Like, to the point where Malik Neighbors has been there for a friggin' cup of coffee. He's like, I'm, I'm already done. Like, I'm already done with these people. The Giants are so poorly managed. Like, if there is ever panic mode, just go for the number one pick now. Like, do it day ball's done probably the gm probably done like there's so many things about the giants that are poorly run but hey jimmy harbaugh gets a win in his debut it wasn't pretty like the chargers look like a jim harbaugh team to me and i know you didn't get to watch a lot of it but no. justin herbert has the biggest arm in the nfl and he's got like 150 yards or something they win by two touchdowns but that's what not what i took away i mean congrats to jim Antonio Pierce, so I'm going to give you a game situation, and I want to ask you, from your coaching standpoint, what you would do. So there's like six and a half minutes left in the fourth quarter. The Raiders have the ball inside or like on the 40-yard line of the Chargers, so they're on positive territory. It's fourth and one. What would you do down six in that situation? I'll mute myself. I would help. Uh, down six in that situation on the plus 40 um six and a half minutes to go i think uh i mean there's a lot of factors you have to take into consideration you know what's going on you know how the game's gone up to that point how did you get to that position you know are you moving the football um but i don't know man i think i'd kick the field goal i think i kicked the field goal and played defense and, and hope to maybe have a shot at the field goal to tie it but like i said there, there's a lot of factors that i don't know like how's your defense is your defense being able to stop the offense are you on a drive have you driven to this point? Yes. Um, and to, you know, because I think if, if you've got some momentum and you're moving the football, I would um, I'd go for it. I think if, if I'm yes. moving the ball, I think I'd go for it. Well, and if, and that's that's what I'm talking about, right? Because Antonio Pierce, it goes back to what you talked about earlier. About I don't know what they did. I didn't head. watch the game, but I would. They punted. Punt. Yeah, I definitely they, wouldn't punt. No, no, they punted. So this is the. <laughs> Antonio Pierce was a guy who got selected because the players all wanted him. And that's fine, right? Like, you want to have your locker room. And that that's all well and good. Like, you want to have guys who your players respond to. But they also have to have merit as a head coach. And that was my first sample size of Antonio Pierce this season as a head coach. And I think I immediately texted the guys. And I was like, well, he's coaching like a guy who doesn't want to keep his job for very long. Because they punted back and ended up giving up a touchdown. And they were now they were down by 12. So it, a punt in that situation is basically like a turnover. It's no different really than going for it. And if you can't trust your guys to get a friggin' yard when you've already been driving, like, what are we doing here? And yeah. that's what I took away from it. Well, it would require one, a, you know, a, a perfect punt to just, you know, hopefully put them in bad field position. Uh, you're so you're so close. You're so on the fringe of it being a touchback. Uh, the, the chances of a touchback occurring where you're really only gaining 20 yards of field position is, is extremely high. There's just not a lot. The risk reward of punting in that situation uh, is not favorable at all whatsoever. That's why that, it didn't even occur to me to punt it. That honestly, that thought <laughs> never even entered my mind. And it was either talking go about for numbers it or either. try the field goal because you know at least you know if you try the field goal at least you're you know, giving yourself a chance to only need a field goal to tie it if you can stop them to where punting, you're still like, well, shit, even if we stop them, we still got to go down and score a touchdown um, at that point in time, probably with how much time would be left on the clock. 
Now, kicking the field goal obviously doesn't increase like your percentage to win by a lot, but it's being more aggressive than punting the ball away. Punting the ball, you might as well just give it to them. Like you're handing that off to them, basically. Now, I do want to acknowledge this comment here. This is Dave who is coming in here late and saying that Antonio Pierce would be the third best coach here if he joined the show. I don't know if that's necessarily true, but I think all four of us now would agree that not one of us would have punted. But Antonio Pierce, I think, is not long for the Raiders' job. And quite frankly, the Raiders, not really the greatest run organization in, oh, in football man. right now. No so uh, they're going to be a dumpster fire this year. So let's look on to week two. So we should say this. Normally, we'd be on a Wednesday. We are on a Thursday. The Bills are kicking the absolute shit out of the Dolphins, 31 to 10. And wow. it is yeah, in the third quarter, halfway through the, the third quarter. quarter. Last time I looked, right where we started, it was 7-7. Seven, seven. And it is not anymore. Tua has not looked all that great. A couple of interceptions. But let's talk about some of the games. So you're a big Baker Mayfield guy. You're a big mcdc guy and those two hurricanes are colliding this weekend in detroit so how do you feel about bucks and lions um i dude i'd be so jacked and not nothing is jared goff or whatever but if freaking baker mayfield was the quarterback of the lions i would just be losing my mind um, like your wet dream uh oh my goodness yes i would love it uh but anyways i uh I think the Lions, I mean, the Lions are rolling. They looked really good last week. I think that they're going to take care of business this week, but I would, uh, I'd expect the Bucks to give them a ball game for sure. I, I think that, um, again, Baker's got that grittiness, man, that toughness to him that we like to talk about here. And uh, so I think they're going to be game, but, um, you know, I, I don't know how you could pick against the Lions here. By the way, couldn't the Browns use a quarterback like Baker Mayfield? Yeah, man. If they would have been fortunate enough to draft a guy like that, I know. Uh, yeah. <laughs> if, if only, if only. And speaking of the Browns, they get to travel to Jacksonville. Now, this one's fascinating to me because the Jags, you know, they're one of those teams where we talked about it a couple of times where they need to really ascend. Trevor Lawrence, I don't know if he's ever going to live up to the expectations of being the number one overall pick, but I still think that he'd probably be taken by a lot of the teams that are in need of a quarterback. But I'm not sure if he's ever going to be what people thought he was going to be. But the Browns, on the other hand, have a quarterback who's completely lost. They have no idea what's going on. And so this is like a redemption game for both of these teams. But I feel like the Jags have a better quarterback situation, despite the global idea that Trevor Lawrence may not be what everybody thought that he was going to be coming out of the draft. Yeah, I mean, you had to think, man, look what Doug Peterson did with uh, freaking... Nick Foles. Let's see what he does with uh, Trevor Lawrence, and uh, hopefully, you don't know though. It, there's there's so much there's so much stuff, man, that has to uh, that goes into this success. I mean, obviously, the roster around you, um, you know, of course, coaching plays a big part in it, not just the head coach, and then it's not always. You know, we talked about. I think maybe I don't know if last year, this year, you know. A lot of times when Trevor Lawrence has played football before he got in the NFL, he probably took the field every week with the most talented team on the field. Um, and the receivers he had at his disposal were probably far superior to who was covering them on defense 90% of the time. And when it's just pitch and catch, man, like in college, they, you know, coaches talk all the time, your quarterbacks say, in college, everybody's open. It's almost shocking how poor some quarterbacks play in college because compared to the NFL standard, Everybody is open in college all the time. And uh, hmm. and so, I mean, so for guys to, to miss guys, it's crazy because the window in the NFL and how fast those guys are and how well coached they are um, is at such a higher level than it is in the college game that, you know, nobody looks like they're, you have to throw guys open um, and fit things into really tight windows. Uh, you know, you have to anticipate um, a lot more than you do it in the college game. And maybe that's just something that he hasn't been able to pick up. And it looks like two is concussed again. It sounds like, how's that? Are we just, <laughs> or is this, is Dave just having some fun? I don't know. I don't have the yeah, game. I don't on, know. So. I mean, I hope not because no that kidding. was brutal to watch last year. So, but that, that would be something that we, we would definitely talk about that. Seattle Seahawks, Geno Smith, who continues to somehow play in the league or traveling to Foxborough. Now, this would be notable if either one of these teams uh, was good. Let's put it that way. Patriots, I think, are, are not good, despite the fact that they won. The Seahawks, I think, are decidedly mid because they really should have beaten the Broncos a lot worse than they did. Bo Nix did not play very well whatsoever. And this is one of those games that you wanted to point out because of the cross-country trip. But I feel like, my goodness, thank God this is on red zone. Yeah, I so I do think that it's not, you know, 
they talk, I mean, as common as it should be traveling across country, I do think there's something to be said for that, uh, the time change, so on and so forth. But same time, these guys are professionals. Um, yeah, it probably doesn't affect them as much as people like to think it does or pretend it does. Um, the Pats getting a win last week, I think is huge. Unlike the NFL or unlike the college game where you maybe get, you know, these guys are not as mature at times and might be feeling themselves a little bit. I think, you know, professionals know that every team is good. You have to prepare every week. Um, I don't think they really go into any game taking anyone lightly and they shouldn't. And so, but it's also a lot easier to prepare and be focused after you just got to win. Um, so I, I do think that, the Patriots kind of have the leg up in that sense that there's a lot of positivity right now around the team. Um, they get, they get a home game. Seattle's got across the country. Seattle was in kind of a dog fight. Um, and so with what, uh, was it Denver? Yes. That, right. At home. They only won yeah. by six points, despite the fact that Bo Nix, I think had like 42 attempts for 150 yards. <laughs> yeah. So, um, you know, they were a little bit of a dog fight. They got to go on the road and, whatnot and i'm sure i'm probably putting way too much stake in some of this stuff but i really feel good about the pats in this game man this is exactly how it's gonna go the pats are gonna win like seven games with jacoby Brissett, and not a one of them is going to be fun to watch i can tell you that right now the yeah, pats baby. are a team made for red zone Bengals at chiefs now on paper this should be a really great matchup but the Bengals, as we just talked about did not look very good not getting good vibes out of cincinnati and the chiefs they're the Chiefs. They're just going to keep rolling on. I feel like this is one of those. Bengals never really win their first game until like late September anyway. So I don't know. The Chiefs, I feel like, are just going to take care of business here. And we're going to find out, like, are the Bengals possibly fraying at the seams? So I'm glad that it's just me, you, Dave, and my dad that are going to hear this. Um, I don't want to say it too loud, but I think the Bengals are done. Oh, they're like, no, I no, think no the say moment, it louder. I think please. the moment has passed. I think I, I yeah, just... Mm. I ooh, I Joe like it. I, like I think Joe at. Burrow's just broken at this point. I hate saying it because I love me some Joe Burrow. I mean, I just think that it's, I think it's done. I think we've seen the best of Joe Burrow. Ooh. I think we've seen the best of the Bengals for a while until we see the next iteration of them once this current uh, roster cycles through, and it sucks and it's depressing because again they play in the you know the gritty AFC North. But um, I, I just I think that ship has sailed man their window closed and it closed fast i love a good hot take in week one because there's 16 more but weeks this has to go been building though man this is not i mean this has been building oh i don't disagree i i don't you, you and i both said that joe burrow was dangerously close to being possibly on the sunset of his career because of all of the injuries it's just a lot of weirdness but this this is all one of those the Bengals have been a traditionally poorly run organizations forever. You know what I mean? Where now they're talking about, oh, we don't really have money to pay Jamar Chase. What are you talking about? Like, he's one of the reasons why you are relevant in any way. So like, find money to pay this guy. You know what I'm saying? It's just, it's odd. And then he doesn't practice. They don't look like they're in sync. Joe Burrow is obviously very talented. I mean, when he's healthy, they are really, really good. Is their head coach any good to Dave's point about Zach Taylor? Like, you know, there, there's so many factors that feel like are in the Bengal, not in the Bengals' favor. And they're playing a, a that this is not a good recovery game, traveling to Arrowhead. You know, I uh I don't want to get too off tangent here, but I know I've caught a little like, you know, whether on TikTok or you know, some parts of political football where they've talked a little bit about the quality of coaching um in the NFL. And I, I don't think they're they're off base because I think back, you know, to let's just say the prior generation of of NFL football, you know, and the the great quarterbacks and the great coaches. There were these just great coaches that were like, I mean, they were like an institution, you know, Bill Parcells and Bill Cowher, um, you know, and some of these guys. And you just, I feel like they just some of these teams cycle through head coaches so quickly sometimes. And one, just everyone's so impatient now. And then they're always going after the next shiny thing, right? And now it tends to be the next shiny offensive genius guy um, to come along to try to be a quick fix. And, you know, you just, I mean, how many guys right now that are coaching in the NFL would you say are like, yeah, Belichick just retired and, and whatever. You know, you got Andy Reid. You know, I know that you know, obviously Sean Payton is still hanging on, although now with the Broncos. 
how many guys are you like, okay, that guy is like, that guy's a Hall of Famer as a coach. Like, you know, right now you can say like that dude's a Hall of Famer. Um, he is uh, like going to go down in history as a legendary coach where I feel like 15 years ago, you probably could have named off like a dozen coach, you know, maybe not a dozen, 10 coaches, then be like, you know, these guys would be, you know, you know, the Tony Dungies of the world. I said Belichick, um, Parcells, Cower. Um, I I don't know. I'm sure I could go on. Uh, maybe it I'm doesn't, completely huh? off. Maybe I'm That's completely, good. maybe I'm completely off base, but I, I just feel like you don't have those, you know, Mike Holmgren. I don't know. I mean, Nice save, kick save at a butte right there. But the th I think that the difference though is Love let's you, take a Smith. There you go. <laughs> oh God, let's take a Sean. <laughs> let's take a Sean McVay for instance. I think you and I would both agree that he's a very sharp head coach. I mean, obviously they won a Super Bowl. He's done a lot with very little there. But even he was thinking about getting out after that Super Bowl because I think guys are just not as willing, at least in my opinion, to stay for like 30, 40 years the way that other guys would. I think it's an older school mentality to do that. And so perhaps that is going to hinder our feeling of a guy that's really good for that moment. I mean, the thing is, is you you don't know. Like a Dan Campbell, great example, seems like a guy who would be in Detroit forever. And if he's there forever, they're gonna do a lot of winning. And that's yeah. your, and he's an older school kind of guy. I mean, but you do have guys that you feel like yeah, they could, like Kyle Shanahan. Kyle Shanahan finally got that Super Bowl under his belt, and now we're talking about him as one of the greatest because he's obviously a great coach. He's sure. obviously successful. I think it's just a matter of that there, our perception is a little bit skewed because it's so difficult with as few people as, like, stay, right? Guys get cycled through so often. Guys that we think are the next up-and-coming guys. I mean, geez, like, Mike McDaniel could be one of those guys, but all of a sudden now, two is not there. The team looks decidedly different, and boom, he's gone, right? He's the flavor of the month, and then boom, he's gone. And it's it's a it's a tough business, man. It's a tough to be a quarter a, a coach in the NFL, but if you're going to do it, you got to be at least good at it. And I think there's a lot of mid coaches out there. Oh, there absolutely are. And Mike Tomlin's guy, you know, I feel like an idiot for forgetting Mike Tomlin, um, you know, and as you should just the dude just wins, wins, right? Um, wins yeah, just enough nothing. anyways. Wins God, just enough. six, well, especially goals. recently, especially recently, uh, oh, you know, they, the town has not been there. Um, but, the guy finds a way to get it done. And, you know, this week we have a battle of two of these guys, right? Mike Tomlin and Sean Payton going at it, right? A, ba a battle of two guys trying to still do it at a high level and uh, keep their careers alive because <laughs> Tomlin wants to coach at a high level, but he doesn't have players that have a high level. This is the problem no. because he's going to have Russ and Fields did not look all that great. The Broncos, uh, I mean, Bo Nix, look, I, you got to give guys passes for like week one, but. I don't think there's much about Bo Nix's game that's going to translate to this is the guy. Like, he's not going to be Drew Brees. That's not what he has. He doesn't have the arm strength for it. He's older. And McVay, I mean, not McVay, uh, Sean Payton, my boy, Sean Payton, is just trying to hold on. He's trying to hold on for some glimmer of hope that he can resurrect a career that has been long over in the dumpster. And you know, I'm not a big Sean Payton guy. But Do you you're think right. these guys go on the TV and then when they're sitting and watch these games and they're like, Man, these coaches are idiots. Yes. I yes. get the chance to get back in this thing. I'm going to go steamroll these guys. <laughs> yes, because and, people and are stroking their egos. Like yeah. people stroke their egos, and not everybody can do it. Sean Payton, the game has passed you by, my friend. Get out while the getting is good. You mentioned that game. Last one I want to mention Falcons at Eagles. The reason that this is interesting does Kirk Cousins look any better? Do the Eagles look good still? Like they still, I think, have some potential, but obviously losing Jason Kelsey. There's a lot of com there's a lot of continuity that they're missing on the offensive line, but I think they're going to get it going. They got a big win in Brazil. Didn't have anybody get hurt really, so let's see how they look there. But 